I tend to think of the historical costume of the Georgian and colonial eras in two distinct categories. The super fancy dress of the very rich and the simpler dress of the working class. I can envision the bright pink silk taffeta of a robe a Francaise, cream colored silk waistcoats with smatterings of embroidered flowers, the bright brocade gowns, the whisper thin linen of a gauze cap. When I envision the costume of the working class, I frequently, and perhaps incorrectly, assume that the latter were made of fabrics that were more muted or drab in color. Sure, these garments were made of sturdier, more work-hardy materials like heavier linens and wool, because you wouldn't plow a field in a silk waistcoat, but the garments were still fashionable in silhouette and style, and that included color. Super bright electric colors were still quite expensive to produce because the cost of time, labor, and materials. It could take up to 20 days to dye certain colors. Additionally, some of the historical mordants that were used were kind of nasty to work with. I'm talking iron salts, alum, and stale piss, because the fermentation created ammonia that could affect a change in color. Mordants bind the dye to the fiber and can determine the success of the wash fastness and light fastness of your final dyed cloth. As a rule, cellulosic fibers like linen and cotton are a bit trickier to dye than protein fibers like silk or wool. I did a year in textile design at school and I loved learning about the natural dye process. These were the dyes most commonly used in the 18th century. I have a few contemporary natural dye reference books, and this one talks about matter, woad, fusic, and calendula, which can be used to make reds, blues, and yellows. I also have some cochineal dye. This is made from the dried bodies of cochineal beetles. The scarlet red coats of the British officers during the American Revolution were dyed with cochineal. From these dyes, one can create a rainbow of color through over dyeing and mordanting. For example, you could dye some cotton blue with indigo and then wash it and over dye it with marigold to get green. I highly recommend checking out the book The Art of Dyeing Wool, Silk, and Cotton by M. Hellet, originally translated from French in 1789. I put a link below to a free online PDF of the whole book. I also had the pleasure of stumbling across some striking 18th century watercolor paintings on Pinterest. After some digging, I learned that they were painted by an Italian illustrator who I believe is called Turin. The Bunker University Library Online has a digital archive of rare materials where I found this book in its entirety. I've also put the link to that below. This book is from 1775 and includes so many incredible examples of casual 1700s dress from a few different countries. When I first saw these paintings, it was like a real revelation for me. Check out her tiny clocked stockings the patterns, I love that they're mixed, I love the accessories, and I like that you can tell that it's block printed cotton. It's incredible. I've been slowly working on an 18th century costume just for fun and learning stuff. I don't really have an exact idea of who this character is yet, but I know she has a profession, or she keeps her own house, so she probably isn't loafing around in silk gowns. That sounds like somebody's driving a boat down my street. <laughs> a boat for water, but on land. And with my foundations mostly done, I really wanted to explore this world of color for outerwear. Here's how I whipped up this apron. I stitched it entirely by hand and I was able to finish it in under two hours. I got this sweet, like dusty rose colored linen gingham fabric because of the paintings that I saw. I think it's a really sweet color and it could be easily achieved by dyeing the threads that are, that are woven um, using some of these historical dye recipes. This is the skirt pattern I made up for my quick apron. It's basically just two big rectangles. The skirt panel is uh, approximately like a yard by a yard and a half. The first step for me was to wash and iron this fabric just to get rid of any finishes that were on it from production. This is the down and dirty part of it. What I did next was I measured my waist and then I added a little bit extra so that I could tie the apron around me um, and then I just ripped what I wanted the waistband width to be. Next I folded it um, and tucked all of those rippy edges on the inside and ironed it flat. I then marked the center of the waistband with a pin and the center of the skirt fabric with a pin. Mm -hmm. 
now I'm attaching the center point to the center point. And I know that I want like a, a three square long box pleat at the front of this apron. This will keep the fabric that's immediately over my tummy flat, um, but I'll have uh, a nice flare at the hip where I pleat it. Next, I held the apron up against my body and I figured out where I wanted the apron to end on the front of my hips. I don't want it wrapping around my back, I just want it to cover the front of my dress. There's lots of complicated formulas for pleat math, but the way that I'm doing this is just folding over my salvage edge, pinning it to the end where I know the apron needs to end, and then visually dividing both points in half. Then I'm tacking the half down, and this is going to help me when I'm doing the pleats by eye. So now I know that I have this much fabric to cover this much waistband. You can even divide it in half further. Um, I, I find that it's helpful to do it this way because then you don't pleat the whole thing and get to the end and go, oh crap, I have to undo it, my pleats are way too tight. Um, if your pleats are too tight or too loose, you're going to know in like a few inches. Uh, so that is, is really helpful for me. I, I'm really good at a lot of things and math is not quite one of those things, or it historically has not been for me. I then whip stitched these pieces together. So here it is all sewn up. I've got my big box pleat in the front and then my nice fluffy little hips. I also used a whip stitch to fasten the tie. For the finishing touches, I turned the salvage edge in and did a quick felling stitch along the whole length of the front of the apron. The final step was the hem. I tied it around my waist and counted how many squares up I needed to iron it, and then I did a felling stitch on this one as well. This was a really fun project for me. I love hand sewing, um, and sometimes I like sitting and making stays and it takes 14 days, and sometimes I like sitting for two hours and just like whipping up a quick thing.